and bring me another bucket of ranch. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I was just busy going to make our editor goblin fetch me more ranch. But now that you're here, I do have something I'd like to talk to you about. First of all, our Rhyme of the Frost Maiden playthrough is being pushed back. Oh, I know, but we have a lot of things we need to edit. We only have one editor goblin, and he's getting me ranch dressing. He can't do it all at once. So, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden will be played in November. Early November is when we will be releasing the first session. Isn't that exciting? And I know, I know, I know. You want to hear the music now, but wait, one more thing. We're also doing something with Patreon. New things with Patreon. If you go to our Patreon right now, that's Patreon slash Dumpstat Podcast and join, kick us a couple of bucks, you will be able to tell us what to do. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be setting out new goals, new tiers, and most importantly, more embarrassing shit for the team to do. That's right. If you right now give us around $10,000, we're going to make Doc get a Lego Harry Potter tattoo. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking Arthur Weasley. I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, back to the magic. This weapon was far too large to rightfully be called a sword. It was larger, thicker, heavier, and cruder than any normal blade. By all accounts, it was no more than a hulking mass of iron. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Stat Dumps, Dump Stat. We, we, we look at stats and we dump them. I am a host, Lich Brill, and I'm depressed because Doc isn't here this week. I had to resurrect a kabold. Hello, a cleric. How are you doing? <laughs> Better than ever. I don't like that answer. I'm an evil lich. Well, yeah. Welcome. But if I'm undead, that makes me intrinsically better than like an undead kobold is going to be better than a kobold just nine times out of ten. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. If it can be either a vampire or a ghoul kobold, I feel like that's way, way better. Just like on principle. I feel like Although a lich kobold would be weird. What would a lich kobold's phylactery be? Like <laughs> a chewed ear or something? Like something really strange. It'd Nothing be... all that elaborate. Yeah. They don't they don't generally have abilities to get the real cool stuff that you want for a lich. Uh, a, right. A kabold lich is a waste. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if you take out the word lich and you said a kabold is a waste, I'd agree. All right. Uh, a <laughs> couple of housekeeping things. This is another one of our lovely villain episodes. Up to this point, we have done Zariel, the Archduchess of the Realm of Avernus. You can check that out in our archive. We've also done Yanagu, the God of Knolls. And if you like hyenas, oh boy, we've got a lot of them in there. But a couple of housekeeping things. We do have a Patreon. And if you would like to go into our Patreon and give us a little bit of money here, it greatly helps us. It feeds our editor goblin. He is just skin and bone. And we need to make sure that all the money goes to him and then back into the show. So if you guys can do that, that would be great. And a few of you have already sent us pictures of your minis. Thank you. We love them. And I'm trying to collect some at the moment. I know I've talked to you a little bit about me trying to get more minis. It's a slog, man. It's a deep <laughs> hole. It's a dangerous, dangerous trap to fall into it's like buying a boat like there's ah, so much it is, it is an infinite pit that you can dump as much money as you want to into yeah i um for the new module that just came out rhyme of the frost maiden i might have been scrolling through the minis for it because i did get the module <laughs> and let me tell you it's been a little bit of a uh, it's been hard not to press the buy button <laughs> I, i've had to like really focus my energy like some tai chi type shit and just Focus, focus, focus. Don't buy, don't buy, don't buy. I bought it, I bought Speaking it. Speaking of focus, what is this episode about? Oh, it's about a Sarah. <laughs> We're getting to him. One more housekeeping <laughs> thing, though. 
you jumpy, jumpy boy, because we have to do this. Otherwise, our gods get mad. I don't know. I wanted to announce here, and we will be continuing to announce it in all of our episodes, that we are doing a module. We are doing Rhyme of the Frost Meta. I didn't just drop that for no reason, guys. I am going to be DMing a full-fledged module where we're going to have four players sit down with me and we are going to run through the module in sessions and that will drop in between episodes here and there. And with that all out of the way, we are going to be tackling one of the villains that is intrinsic to D&D to the point where it's the monster on the DMG for 5e. It's the big bad in a lot of ways. It's the Demilish, uh, Sidorak, Asirak, Asirak. Uh, there's a lot of ways to say it, I've noticed. Chris Perkins even made a tweet about it. <laughs> what is it? It's Asirak, right? I, I saw it as Asirak, but... Asirak. Asirak? If there's one thing that... that Comments will know better than either of us how to pronounce a word, so... Oh, 100%. Uh, I will defer to the comments on how it's pronounced. I totally agree. And to to be fair, I can understand... Like in Batman, is it Ra's al Ghul or Raz al Ghul? You know, I could imagine there's a lot of different interpretations. I've never heard Ra's al Ghul. Interesting. You've never heard that? Yeah, I've heard it all, man. No, I've only ever heard the second one. Really? Wait, yeah. Did I say Ra's or Raz first? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but but <laughs> whatever. Uh, but we are talking about a fundamental villain who has been in D&D for so long that I think his history is muddled yes. and weird yes and not anything really canonized no i know that throughout editions a lot of different monsters gods demons they all start to get strange backstories but it's usually kind of like well he's so old x you know if you start talking about why asmodeus did this here and did another civil war there and murdered bell over here it kind of makes sense because he's so old mm -hmm. but Sirac, we know his origin story and it switches up a lot and on top of that we don't know what he's really doing and we kind of don't know exactly what he wants we have an inkling about what he wants i i think he's a really fun villain to check out but at the same time i could understand a new dm being confused so first things first that i think is confusing asirak is a lich an undead powerful lich but he's not a lich lich he is a demi lich alaric do you know what a demi lich is it changes in general, I would describe a demi lich <laughs> as a lich that is above a lich, which is not what demi means, but no. it is in this case. <laughs> to my understanding, a demi lich is a lich that got so bored of being a lich, they just went full spirit and kind of abandoned the body part entirely. Yes, demi lich is kind of super cool and super dumb. It's super cool because essentially it's a lich, at least by 5e. Right. I know in 4E and 3.5, it gets weirder. And if you get any earlier than that, it gets stranger still. <laughs> but the whole premise of being a lich, as I am one and you are an ugly little kobold, so I'll explain it. The premise of being a lich is the a mage doesn't want to die. By the way, go to our How to Run a Lich episode if you want to learn more. But it's a it's a mage who just decides I don't want to die. I want to live forever. Then a demi lich is a lich who's lived so long that he decides, or she, or they decide, hey, you know what? Instead of having a body and you know living forever, I'm gonna die in a weird way. Like I still <laughs> am on the material plane, but I'm going to project my consciousness through the time space continuum. I'm going to be more of a ghost than a physical zombie body. And mm -hmm. I'm kind of going to do my own thing. It feels like death with extra steps. And that's what <laughs> makes me, I, I kind of think it's a little dumb in that regard. I think the floating jeweled head of a Demi Lich is cool. Each jewel mm -hmm. is a soul gem where they capture more souls. But a Demi Lich can also weirdly just go back to his regular body whenever he kind of wants if he gets enough souls. It's a, it's a very weird uh, starving yourself to kind of die, but you're not really dead, but you're a ghost who just gets more freedom in ghost world, along with all the magic powers. The, the Demi stands more for Demi clarity than for Demi power. Right. <laughs> it's for, it's for Demi, 
yeah, sure. Kind of a lich. <laughs> he's kind of a lich. He's basically a lich. And but and that's the other confusing thing for new players about a demi lich is a lich has a higher CR than a demi lich. So <laughs> naturally, yeah. naturally, a lich should be more powerful than a demi lich. But a demi lich in the canon it has more traps. Probably has a bigger lair has lived longer. Uh, his actual stats of a Demi-Lich has a higher, I believe, charisma and intelligence. So it's a very strange dynamic. And I could see a new player walking in to being like, okay, what is this? To really get confused. And the reason why I give that base level is because of all the Demi-Lichai, liches, <laughs> lichy, lichy boys, <laughs> Asirak is the most famous. Frankly, he's in the top five of undead villains. One of them's Vecna, the other one's Orcus, and probably Strahd. Those are probably your big undead characters from D&D that everybody knows. And Asirak is up there for being popular, but I don't think a lot of people know a lot about him. And it's because of his canon being so confusing, right? Yeah. We see his beginnings... Like all great D&D villains, they're all related somehow. So <laughs> his origin story is very muddled. In some cases, he's a half-demon devil guy. In other cases, he's a tiefling. Uh, there are a couple of cases where I saw that he was the angel devil son. But no matter the case, clearly chosen one-ish at birth. Asirak basically gets under the tutelage of Vecna, who's the god of liches. And this was back when Vecna was trying to discover how to be a lich and then how to be a god. You know, there's steps. And then Asirak following in that path becomes a lich and then makes a lot of dungeons that really is the long like the base <laughs> notes that we can all sort of agree on he was under vecna he's devoted to orcus but wanting to overthrow orcus and he kills people through tombs and at some point between tomb number one and maybe tomb number two or maybe halfway through tomb number one we're not sure he said i'm gonna be a demi lich <laughs> i'm not gonna be a, a lich anymore because he started the tomb of horrors as a wizard mm -hmm. and then ended somewhere on the lich demi lich continuum so it's very muddled and you can tell the age of the character for how much there is of him wouldn't you say yeah no there, there's clearly uh, a couple different versions of a Sarah floating around in the collective consciousness of D&D &D. you've got the the classic lich version and he is maybe the most famous classic lich character aside from maybe Vecna himself but Vecna at this point is more of a deity than a lich in a lot of people's brains right so I would say Sarah is your archetypal lich character and obviously the Tomb of Horrors is possibly the most famous of all modules. So he gets a lot of awareness from being associated with that. But because of the way Tomb of Horrors is set up, so few characters that do that adventure actually even get to him. So like he's way more of the name drop villain than he is the actual right. appearance villain. He he strangely reminds me of Nick Fury in a lot of ways. And I'll get into Ooh. it. But Ooh. one of those ways is just because shield is big tomb of horrors is big and nerds can name drop shield and nick fury but if you ever like needle them and be like tell me what shield does <laughs> <laughs> they go ah! you know <laughs> so and and then you could ask them and what is Nick Fury's goal? And they'll go, Gah! you know, where's he from? Ah! You know, we have the big point. And we're, we're going to get into the Tomb of Horrors and the Tomb of Annihilation, mm -hmm. both of which are creations of Asirak or Asirak Ace, Mr. Rack. Mr. Rack? Okay. Both, yeah, sure. Mr. <laughs> Rack. Yes. Both are creations of his and both of their main goals are strangely enough just to kill adventurers. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we get into the motivation of Asira Rack. He is as lichy as lichy comes, right? You think that a eons old lich would have a bigger plan than just <laughs> being a lich, but Asira Rack really <laughs> inhabits that. I just want to kill adventurers and get their souls, man. That's it. 
I, he likes to build dungeons that are deadly for adventurers. They wander in and he kills them, takes their soul so he can just keep building more dungeons. And that's the weird loop. There is some canon that says that he wishes to surpass Orcus, who he's devoted to, to kind of become a new god of undeath, like Orcus is the demon prince. Hmm. But as far as that goes, especially in 5e, it doesn't sound that way. Uh, if you look up the actual in Tomb of Annihilation, which is a module that came out for 5e that mirrors the classic Tomb of Horrors, which is also updated for 5e due to the Yawning Portals uh, source book, Tomb of Annihilation name drops a Sirarak a lot. It has tidbits about him, but if you flip over to his actual stat block and read the blurb, it's two paragraphs, which I don't know about you, anytime a huge name villain like the Demogorgon, any of the demon princes, Storm King's Thunder's main giant, like any of them, anytime there's a big guy, the the blurb near the stat block is usually a bit longer than a couple <laughs> of sentences. A Cyrax is ancient demi lich he travels the multiverse he makes dungeons and then the second paragraph is he made this dungeon <laughs> that you played <laughs> way to go <laughs> And when you read that, there's this initial feeling of, and what is he like? <laughs> what is he doing? So I want to start there because I think he's a fun name character to use in a homebrew setting, actually. Okay. I think he can even be more fun than maybe an Orcus might be for like an undead villain, right? So I'm, I'm going to make my case on this, but I do want to warn everybody right now, lore-wise compared to every other character we are probably going to cover on this miniseries, he is fucking Plato. <laughs> he is... He's everything and nothing. He could show up in his pajamas and no one would bat an eye. So the first mentions, I think, of Asirarak, there might have been other mentions of him in Greyhawk. But wh what is most known for is the classic Tomb of Horrors, which somewhat spoilers for that coming up. Alaric, can you tell us what the Tomb of Horrors is? The creation of Asirarak. What is it? All right. So the Tomb of Horrors is essentially Asirarak gloating about how much better he is at life than any adventurer can ever hope to be. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the idea that he can make a dungeon, give you a riddle at the start about how to get through his dungeon... And you still won't be able to get through his dungeon to go and fight him. That's essentially the, the long and the short of Tomb of Horrors is I am a super powerful lich. I've got a dungeon that no one can beat. Here, let me give you some hints and you're still not going to be able to beat it. He's basically just flexing the entire time. Right. And to his credit, Tomb of Horrors is a stupidly difficult dungeon. It was the OG stupidest. Yeah. <laughs> it, it became famous, and we can talk about the meta story behind it. Mm -hmm. Gary Gygax, the creator of D&D, &D, he had players, and he had noticed players of D&D, &D, were not only cocky, but were kind of saying, well, we're so powerful, what next? Because classic D&D &D did have the wizard spike, weirdly enough, in leveling. <laughs> you suck for almost the entire campaign, and then the last few levels, you're a god, right? So mm -hmm. with that kind of in mind, he had these players who are like, we can't be beat. So I think there's a little bit when he created it and created a Sirac, that DM versus player mantra were, was definitely in his head. Definitely. It's a challenge to players, right? It's to challenge them, but it is sadistic. Like it is sadistic to the point where it became the famous death dungeon. The Tomb of Horrors is the legendary dungeon that kills all players. People in the early days of the internet used to call it impossible to be. It's this idea of a death dungeon that is so deadly and so misgiving with what it is that you almost immediately always die. And what I find most interesting about the Tomb of Horrors, along with that stupid riddle that Asirarak gives you in the actual campaign, it's all puzzles. Mm -hmm. It's all stupid, stupid puzzles and traps, <laughs> which you don't think about those anymore in dungeons. I, I mean, frankly, 5e is such a combative 
module traps and puzzles have got kind of put by the side. And to think about a dungeon that is traps, it is clever traps. And that certainly plays into a Cyrax, I guess, whole persona of I'm better than you. I thought of everything. I thought of something to kill you. And you should have thought of that. (laughs) But you are right. The beginning of the dungeon is a poem. It's a riddle. It's a poem. People call it a poem. Which, okay, he, hear me out on why Asirak could be a great villain. I'm going to talk about the poem, and then I'm going to jump to another piece of the dungeon. Okay. And these two pieces are my argument, almost inherently. <laughs> I'll get to the Tomb of Annihilation later, but I, I'm going to talk about the Tomb of Horrors. So in the Tomb of Horrors, if you look it up, The most famous bit of the Tomb of Horrors is the beginning hallway. Now, why is that? Most people don't live past it. (laughs) That's all he ever sees. Yeah, that's that's really it. And in this hallway, if you stare at the ground for like 45 minutes, (laughs) you get a riddle from a Sirarak. And it's rude. It's fucking rude because it's so cryptic. You can't figure it out. I'm sorry. You won't be able to. And also, moreover, it has this air of, well, you're you're never going to figure this out anyway, cryptic or not. Like, I am helping you with a hint, even though it's not a real fucking hint, a Sirarak. And then at the end of it, what what's what's it say right at the end of the poem? Something, something that your soul will be mine, I believe. Yeah. It's basically saying, even if you get there, I'm going to kill you anyway. So screw you. Right, right. Yeah, no, you've left and left and found my tomb and now your souls will die. Yeah. It's shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you you re- so the beginning bit of the tomb is mocking the player and most players die in that hallway, at least in the OG game. 5e, the update's a little bit different. And then there's another thing. And this is a bigger spoiler for Tomb of Horror. So if you want to play it, Editor Goblin's going to scream when you should jump to. One minute and eight seconds for the super spoiler, but they kind of talk about it for the whole episode, though. One minute and eight seconds. Okay, so later in the tomb, <laughs> you go through this fucking tomb, and it is, it is, it's kind of the worst. It, you're dying a ton. It's really, it's a really, really rough dungeon. And you get to a point where there's a corpse that claims to be a Sirarak lounging on a fucking futon. And he, no, it's a couch. It's like it's like a, a decadent lich yeah. who's gorge, by the way, just covered in cobwebs, just kind of lounging on a couch. And the players go, ah, and they try to kill him and they kill the decoy. Right. And it is a decoy. Mm-hmm. And then the DM says 10, 9, 8, like the place is going to blow up. They bounce. And the DM is supposed to go. So did you think it was hard? So this is a fake out. That is not a Sirarak. But I can infer a lot about a Sirarak from this. First of all, why is he like Nick Fury? Why don't you tell me? Why do you think he's like Nick Fury? Is it the fucking Uh, life model decoy? Life model decoy? (laughs) Yeah. Like, what? And not only is it a life model decoy, but it's a decadent bitch life model decoy. It is. He's fabulous. (laughs) He's on a couch in purple robes with a fucking crown on him, lounging like he's a fucking Roman emperor. What is going on here? And then on top of all that, cherry on top, it's not really him. You didn't beat the bad guy. Fuck you, player. That is a piece of the Tomb of Horrors. It is deadly. It'll take your gear. It'll switch your gender. It'll kill you. All those things can happen. And at the end, you might not have even killed the bad guy. You might have failed. So when I look at Asirak and I go, what is he like? Homeboy taunts? Homeboy writes fucking poems? <laughs> and Homeboy makes his decoy lounge on a fucking couch? That's a lot. That is... In a room that no one will ever reach, too. Yeah. Like, it, it's not like, an, a, not like a display of decadence. It's a... It's a I'm decadent in this room by myself for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yes, it is a pompous opulence that is nary ever reached. And that's one of the issues I have with Asirak. Because when I looked at the dungeon, 
I saw a DM flexing on his players. <laughs> In game, I saw a lich who is a decadent bitch flexing on the adventurers. And I noticed, strangely enough, that my take of a Asirak being, uh, we'll say, kind of a snob, kind of like, haha, you know, kind of having a bit more personality to him, I think is not the take that people get or people use. And the reason why I say that is because in the D&D community, there's a tendency for a guy to read a Wikipedia page because there's so much canon. You can't buy all the books. You're going to go on wiki, right? You're going to go to a Wikipedia page and you're going to read all about it. And then some of those guys make YouTube videos so it's easier for people to digest. And then some of the, those people who make YouTube videos work at Wizards of the Coast and make D&D Beyond videos, right? All that to being said, I noticed that the take most people have about a Asirak is he doesn't care about the adventurers. He just wants to kill them for food, right? For sustenance, to get their soul. Who the fuck here has written a poem to their food? <laughs> Right? Who lies on a couch for their cheeseburger that isn't even them on the couch? That's extra, everybody. I'm sorry. I, I And this is why I like him as a villain. I can have this take that he is a decadent, fanciful weirdo <laughs> who in his strange wealth has decided to build extreme death traps across the multiverse for no other purpose than he's a sadistic fuck. I don't really think he wants to overthrow Orcus. I think he's a sadistic fuck. I don't think he's an <laughs> eons old mastermind. I think he's so smart, he likes to wave it around at players or at, at adventurers through murder. I can have that take and someone else can have the take of he is the monolith lich like he he is just the bad he is just a lich who is so beyond us we could never understand him although again he was laying on a futon or he wasn't but he what you get me right like that's a lot he wants you to think he was what <laughs> You're right. You're right that it is just a room, isn't it? Like you just walk into a room and he's just, yeah. hey guys. Like, he's walking into a room. It's not even a big room. No. It's not like a it's not like a fancy room full of treasure. It's just a room that he's in. On a couch, lying. Yeah. Lying down casually. It's a couch. I, I, it really does irk me that when people like talk about certain villains, uh, not that they have different takes, but sometimes it feels so obvious to me and people don't see where I'm coming from. And I'm like, guys, 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 no, 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 no. He's a dandy. What are you talking about? <laughs> why, why, why are we arguing? Who writes poems? Who is? Okay. Did the Demogorgon with his tentacles ever write me a poem before a, a murder? No. <laughs> OK, and, but here's the thing, that personality, that persona could be fun. And this is why I think Tomb of Horrors is a module or a dungeon that is I, I think a, a word might be it's a little outdated for 5e. Would you agree with that or am I kind of stepping out of line? Here? So so Tomb of Horrors is very, very much a product of the earlier editions of D&D. Of course. Where fighting things is bad, dying is frequent. So you got sections of Tomb of Horrors that are literally pointless fights designed to drain your party of resources. And that's a tactic that the player is supposed to recognize is happening to them and to avoid. That is an entirely different mindset of how to play D&D than you have in 5e. In 5e, you're the hero, so there's monsters there, you should stop them. Right. In in earlier editions, like the when Tomb of Hearts is first coming out, you see monsters. You're not really getting, because you didn't get XP for fighting monsters. You got XP for getting the treasure. Right. So if you saw a tough monster with no treasure, you should just not go into that room. That was the correct move in that case. Right. So Tomb of Hearts is a perfect example of doing nothing is the correct move sometimes. And actually, a lot of the times in the case of Tomb of Hearts. Yeah. And I, I mean, and you're right. Between these two, and it's a big jump between the editions. Oh, yeah. It's interesting to see them kind of take 
Tomb of Horrors because it's a legacy module, right? There was Return of the Tomb of Horrors where mm -hmm. Tomb of Horrors has a cult of Sidorak built around it and <laughs> like a necropolis. And then yeah. there, uh, I was it, I think it jumped through 3.5 and 4 at least. I, I believe so. I knew, I know it was in 4 at some point. So it, it's a legacy dungeon that is too popular not to bring along. But once it's updated in 5e, People who play it in the yawning portal will notice that that humor I just had about him being a decadent bitch, you know, and I'll keep using it. <laughs> it's not there. It's not it's not a humorous dungeon. It, it can be a bit of a slog and new players might say, hey, why didn't I get a DC save? Why didn't get a saving throw for that? Mm. Oh, oh, I just oh, I just got killed by that thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just dead. Mm -hmm. There's a way to make that fun and I can jump back to that. But I think a better way to go is. Tomb of Annihilation is a, a Sidorak dungeon made for 5th edition, and it is based on the Isle of Cholt, which is kind of the far-flung island jungle place of the Forgotten Realms, I believe. What, is it Forgotten Realms? No, it's Forgotten Realms. Okay, and it, it's, you know, it's where Tabaxis are from, I believe, as well, and it is a popular spot, and in this popular spot, a Sidorak has made yet another tomb, the Tomb of the Nine Gods. Got his thing he's he made another one he's probably got a thousand more somewhere yay for him he's done it again gang woohoo and then this time <laughs> he's kind of sort of killed some gods and as the module starts out it lets you go to cholt and explore this isle and enjoy the many places and things you can go and then later on you have to go into the dungeon and it's a bit more of a death dungeon as well because a Sidorak, you know he's on brand but that whole module has humor to offset the death that you will most likely experience later on and i think that's a very smart thing to do it doesn't make the humor come from a Sirac, which I would do as a DM, but I think it has humor in there. It actually had the guy who did Adventure Time jump on to make humor in the NPCs and some of the situations. That really helps balance the scales in my eyes, because it's really hard to just huck death at players for four hours and expect them to be happy. You know, there has to be rise and fall action. There has to be a story that you overcome. To just say, I beat you into the dust is frustrating. And maybe some players will enjoy that, but I don't know if that's players en masse. That's a fl it's a flavor. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No, there's some players who will be perfectly happy with a DM versus player scenario. They just want to, they, they want, they actually would welcome the challenge of, Here's the DM trying to kill me as hard as they can, but I'm too smart for them. That is a style of play. Right. But particularly with 5e, they've been heavily trying to push a more story focused, community focused, friendly, let's all have a good time as a group style of D&D, &D, which drastically conflicts with the whole concept of the Tomb of Horrors. Right. They, they are pretty much 90 degree angles. So Tomb of Annihilation is a attempt to weave those two together, which it, it succeeds or fails. That's up to your interpretation. Of but course. It is a necessary step. Right. I think it's a nicer blend is all I'm getting at. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you might say, well, it's trying to give something to everyone and it might fall flat here or there. But I think that attempt is still a good idea. And when it comes to the character of a Sidorak, however, while he does have mentions in Tomb of Annihilation, he is Mr. I built a dungeon and walked the fuck away. And <laughs> yeah. that's why I think as a DM, here is my suggestion on using him, okay? First of all, make him fun a little bit in the sense of maybe goading poems. He seems to like those. Uh, great flavor. Yeah. I, I say make a dungeon and say it's from a Sirac, right? That immediately gets players going, ooh, oh my. The one on the the one on the box? Okay. That immediately is a good hook. There is a dungeon. It's from this famous dungeon maker, and the villain is more the dungeon than him, right? Very much. But still have when they go in, aka as Tomb of Horrors kind of deal, a riddle, a, a goading, a, a kind of push 
them in, right? He wants their soul. He wants to eat their soul. So it's it's a challenge. And I would balance a deadly, scary, horrific puzzle in trap-filled dungeon and really try to expand yourself as a DM. Really push yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so a uh, dungeon with a stair rack, particularly if you're making your own, is a great chance to try a different concept for a dungeon than we normally do these days because it's not going to be straightforward. It's not going to be a guided experience. It, it does become, if you're a DM for 5e and you want to do an Assyriac dungeon, you really have to walk two paths at the same time where you're both baffling and unclear, but also clear enough that your players are going to have a good time. And that's, I think, the shift that you got from 5e that you have to incorporate if you want to make an Asterak themed dungeon. So you got to make it look really puzzly because it is. And it is really puzzly and trappy and all kinds of the nasty side of dungeons that are realistic, but can be just frustrating and not fun to play. And you have to figure out a path through that that is rewarding for your players who are spending their time with you and they're not just playing something else. And one of those ways that you can make it rewarding, but not assassinate the character of a Sidorak is having him. I think having a goading villain is a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think having a villain, maybe not having him show up, right? But his personality is in the very walls and traps themselves, right? I, it's kind of like uh, the Riddler. I know we're just going through comic books. <laughs> <laughs> your batman is showing i don't mean to it was like rachel ghoul razel ghoul nick fury the riddler we're talking about i don't know doom patrol next i'm sorry guys but when the riddler taunts batman right it is taunting it's a puzzle and there is a vibe of you won't be able to figure it out and your beginning poem or riddle could be that and you know have fun with it be creative but as the traps go on the traps themselves can have like for instance in the tomb of horrors there's a chapel and in that chapel you see weird pictures of a Sidorak, possibly from a before time, right? You could have him in an image taunting players. You could have him in a message on the walls taunting them to go further, teasing them, saying that they're weak. Oh, you'll never figure it out. Oh, you don't have this. That's what the Riddler does to Batman. And that's enough for Batman to try to want to break his teeth in, right? It gives them that drive of, ooh, I'm going to kill him. Ooh, I'm going to knock him out. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt him. And the fact that he's a bit fabulous, we might say, I, I mean, it could be a great encounter to have him use another decoy, right? I think using the decoys for Sirac is fun. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think the bad thing is telling the players afterwards, hey, you killed him. I think that's a little bit silly. The the meta-ness is a bit childish, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That That's just a hoodwink. You're just trying to get one over on them. I would do something more akin to he just mocks you and mocks you and he's just he's grating. The walls are him. The sound down the corridor is him and not him in the sense that he's physically there. But the players will be talking about how just what kind of a madman would build this maze of disgusting traps and puzzles. And every time you fail, you feel dumb and it maybe brings you back to the front of the dungeon and you see the glowing riddle on the ground and you're just, ah, I hate him. You know, you just want to <laughs> kill him. And then you get into a room and he's on a couch. like He's there and you charge. You got, you got him. But maybe in the riddle, it says something to the kind of never trust my image or something like that, or never trust my visage. And they charge a Sirac and the trap springs and he laughs. <laughs> Ha ha! That was just some zombie, you know? <laughs> and you're like, fuck, we have to go deeper into this fucking place. And it's fun having that frustration in a way because that makes a good villain. I think one of the reasons why people like Strahd, for instance, is I've seen a lot of DMs use Strahd just kind of walk around Barovia. <laughs> I've seen that a lot where Strahd will just kind of surveil his his kingdom for some reason. I, I kind of don't get it, but it's nice to have the villain kind of walk up to the players and go, can't get me. <laughs> and just, you know, run away. 
And the players go, actually, we're the best and we're going to fuck you up, buddy. Just wait. We're coming. We're coming. And it <laughs> takes time and it builds. I, I, I also think the Asirak idea of the very nature of the tomb and fury to players because I kind of did that in the previous campaign where my main villain was a lich and I just made sure almost every source of evil kind of goes back to that one character. So it started to build in the players' minds like, oh, I hate that guy. Oh, I, I'm going to kill him. And then to have him have this kind of taunty attitude when they found him, eh, you just want to destroy him. And you don't get that a lot with other undead villains. Strahd's not much of a taunter. He taunts. I'm not saying he doesn't, but it, he's not in a robe on a couch. You know, Orcus just is nihilism. Vecna is more a god. The Demogorgon is just screaming. Like there's not having that undead ha 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 type thing is something unique that you can give a Syrac. And I find it interesting that my version seems to be very different than other people's version. <laughs> I don't know what you think about a villain that kind of taunts the players to get them going, but I think it's a great idea. Oh, I think it's great. I if I was making a, a Serac dungeon, I would throw in the the classic uh, magic mouth that just delivers taunting messages at various points in the dungeon. Magic mouse? Just a mouth in a wall that will say something if you come near it. Huh. Very old school thing that doesn't show up much anymore, but it used to be a staple. I've never heard of that. They're like a, a first edition thing. Okay. Huh. Put a mouth in a wall, have it say something weird. It can be uh, a way of just <laughs> doing a riddle. It can be a way of taunting. It can be a way of warning, but it's just... It's just a mouth and a wall and it said something weird and then disappears. It's very simple and magical and going to be frustrating if you use it right. Right. It'll, it'll kind of it's it's your sibling twisting something. Exactly. And I don't want to say humble them with insults and taunts. No. I'm saying make sure at the apex of your failure or, or their <laughs> failure, I should say, right at the climax, they know who fucking did it. <laughs> like That's. <laughs> That's the big thing, making sure the message gets across that they will die. And that's the other thing. I mean, I'm fine with deadly places and I like to warn my players about deadly places, but I'm fine with deadly places. I think I'm less OK with just you step on a tile and you get vaporized. And that's why I look at Tomb of Annihilation as a better update for the actual character but the update is kind of the character assassination like the tomb is better a Sirac feels lesser he, he doesn't have his poems he's barely in it yeah he doesn't have his poems he doesn't have he doesn't have his stupid couch moment he doesn't <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have his weird chapel or his kidnapped siren. He needs these things to feel weird. He's a very, I mean, he is the OG DM taunting people. And I think it's very apropos that he's on the DMG for fifth edition. So mm -hmm. I would also like to give one other kind of piece of advice. In the same way that in Tomb of Annihilation, they added a sense of humor to it. If I was going to run Tomb of, Annihil uh, Tomb of Horrors, which is from the Yawning Portal, what I would do is start on a fun note and make sure that, yeah, we're going to die, but it's fun. I think uh, an easy way to do this is in the actual meta. Bring your friends around the table. Have them have a stack, like a forest stack <laughs> of characters. I mean it. And have them start with characters at level one, because that's kind of funny. <laughs> and then you have an NPC who has a tent pitched outside. Don't do the. I don't like the bustling city, right? Just have a character who has a tent outside. Maybe our old wizard from our uh, one campaign, Sindleton, <laughs> or another NPC that you've made. Let's say Sindleton. Sindleton, the wizard, <laughs> wants the shit in the Tomb of Horrors. He wants it but he knows not to go in there, right? <laughs> so what he does is the joke is every 30 minutes, he summons a new adventurer. <laughs> and with a stopwatch, he goes, time, and they charge in. <laughs> then as a DM, you put on some post-disco music, put on It's Raining Men, okay? And <laughs> start, start at a fun note, okay? Go, and they all charge in. And then they get obliterated. And then the next guy is like, okay, that didn't work. Go. 
And maybe Sindleton starts to be like, okay, uh, how about Boots of Flying? Do you want Boots of Flying? Here's the Iron Flask. Oh my God, look at this. It's the Wand of Orcus. Like he just keeps <laughs> adding more shit. So suddenly it's this like tidal wave just trying to take down this dungeon. And to the one character who actually does it goes the bragging rights. I've seen people try to handle the Tomb of Horrors in 5e like we min-max the shit out of this one character and he's awesome and he goes in. And sometimes those characters, like I've heard of stories where they go through the whole tomb and they're fine, but it's super cautious and lucky and they like look around every corner and they talk about everything and it takes way too long. Or B, the guys who are super prepared, but they charge in and they just get obliterated. So I would do the wave technique, the reigning men technique, trademark. <laughs> the only final thing I would do, first of all, that Sindleton like talk shit back to a Sidorak. I don't know why I want them to have a weird rivalry somehow, but that's more fun. Fabulous wizards arguing. That's the best. And two, you got to give each character uh, sending stones. So right before they die, they tell the next person to avoid it. So that way the, the meta knowledge is allowed to pass through. And just give them funny names. Each character, give them a silly name. The devil cannot maintain mockery. And there is a way to have fun with this dungeon if the initial concept doesn't make you happy, right? Or, I mean, booze also help too. There's a lot you can do. <laughs> Do, do you have any tips for the Tomb of Horrors? Just either running it or being a uh, well, player so in like it? The, for, from, from my perspective, it's always been the one that got away dungeon. So when you've got a character that their story is kind of over with, and this, is, this fits better with earlier editions where you have a character who's done it all and you're kind of ready to play a new character. Oh, you send your party into the Tomb of, uh, Tomb of Horrors, they'll all die and we can roll up new characters. It's kind of like the fun finale of maybe I'll get through this time. But that's an entirely different mindset from a modern character. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless that's what you find entertaining about a character. So like there's I think it's few and far between nowadays that you'll find a character, a player who's invested years of the character and wants to see them die in a dungeon. Right. Once upon a time that was fun, but now it is not. So right. I kind of like your idea. <laughs> oh, the it, it's raining men. Where you where you've got characters that are designed for this, they're going to take casualties because yeah, you're not going to get through the tomb of annihilation or tomb of horrors without anyone dying. It's just not going to happen. So uh, it, it would exhaust the tomb of horrors for me if I did that. It'd be a thing that you did once, and you probably wouldn't want to play tomb of horrors again after doing that. Right. But if you want to actually see the whole tomb of horrors in play, that feels like a good way to do it. Right. And it's also the Tomb of Horrors just feels like a feather in your cap. Mm -hmm. As far as a Sirac, the actual character, I would, if you're making your own dungeon, like we said, taunting. He's malleable in the sense of he can be the removed lich that doesn't deal with you, or he can be really in your face with how he taunts. And I feel like that's the original spirit of the tomb because the original spirit is Gary Gygax saying, fuck you players. I like the tidbit where his revenge, if he does get chased off and like teleports away, his revenge won't be on you. It'll be on your family's descendants. Right. So like he's just living long enough. It's like, oh, you beat me. I'll get my revenge. And then he'll leave you with that. I'm going to get my revenge at some point, but he's in no rush. He'll do it to like your great, great grandson or something like that. Right. I mean, Wizards of the Coast likes to say that one of the big secrets of Dungeons and Dragons is that we don't know where his phylactery is <laughs> because a phylactery is where the soul, the main soul of the Lich is and every phylactery you need to feed it souls for the Lich to continue to survive. But here's my thing. It's the tombs, right? Like it's the tombs. It's it's the dungeons are his phylactery. It's definitely that that is absolutely the answer. I don't know why anyone's thinking that it's like cool or in, I don't know. You got like this conspiracy web around the tombs. It's absolutely the tombs. It makes like a big sigil of some kind that is his phylactery <laughs> or something. But, oh no, and, and by the way, I do agree. The Descendants, since his phylactery is fine, he will live eons. Yeah. He's the character that can't die. And the reason for that is probably because he's a mascot. Uh, but... <laughs> But that's okay. He's only had three canonical deaths and he's come back twice canonically. Yeah. And one time they had to go back in time to kill him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. 
It's fine. That that is hilarious. That he has such a twisted comic book canon that there is a moment where it's like we gotta go back in time to kill baby Hitler. I mean a Sidorak. Uh, and <laughs> jump in the fucking time tubes. Jump over there, and they're just like, "There he is. Get him. He's weak, <laughs> and he survived somehow." Because fuck it, he is time travel. His, well, yeah. I mean, his his phylactery is so hidden, Alaric, that it, time can't hurt it. Or something. I don't know. Ah. Um, it's, I mean, it's the other reason why, like, Vecna can't permanently kill, Tiamat can't permanently, um, it's Modius, they can't be permanently killed. None of them can permanently die. Because if they do, then what about next campaign? Like, you know, I, I get it. I get it. You want to use them again. I get it. But they live so long that some of this canon is looking straight up like Marvel reboots. Okay. <laughs> it's looking messy it looks like you need a crisis on infinite earth to fucking clean this shit up as serac is a known multiverse traveler he is right from greyhawk he's in forgotten realms and that's just something you have to accept but oh my other little tip i do want to give people his stat block is out there it's from tomb of annihilation he's a cr23 i genuinely think that at the end of a tomb if they get through all the bullshit they should fight him <laughs> it's hard it's a hard fight it's stronger than most lich it's right between a lich and a fucking demon prince but he's got fun he's got an like, annihilation it's not easy no it's not <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I'm I'm actually happy that he does have that. That's very Tomb of Annihilation. And Tomb of Horrors is the sphere of Annihilation. That's very yeah. of the character. I'm glad he has that. And he has the big old hat with the staff. Have him show up, bam, have him fight. I, I think a fight is deserved, especially nowadays. Don't just cackle into the night, you <clears throat> douche. He'll come back. Like, I'm fine with the DM after he's defeated. The DM going like, I'm going to get your grandkids. Like, that. that's fine. But I don't think there should be there should be a payoff. Uh, even the original Tomb of Horrors has a payoff like that. So have him fight. But at the same time, just be wary. If you use him, it's going to be a lot of traps. It's going to be a lot of, we'll say, riddles of the night. <laughs> and then there's going to be a lot riddles of death. Riddles of the night? Riddles of the night. Yeah, that's a term. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Why, uh, who cares? Who cares? Who am I to question another lich? <laughs> God damn right. <laughs> actually, so I'm going to I'm going to actually end this with me opening up my notes and talking about my Asirak dungeon. So uh, recently, <laughs> recently, there was a source book that came out, the mythic Odyssey of Theros, <laughs> which is a Greek and Roman inspired source book based on around the Magic the Gathering universe. I have notes about making an Asidorak dungeon in the mythic Odyssey of Theros that is has all the big legendary deadly monsters in there. It's all weird puzzles based on like floating one of those classic Greek ships up on a water thing and trying to balance it out with a bunch of geysers of infinite water or something like that. <laughs> a lot of fight this ancient Spartan guy here, best him in combat. And at the end of it, a Sidorak on that futon eating <laughs> olives and grapes. Is that not where he belongs? <laughs> He does it's have where the, he the Roman decadence. It's where he belongs. He's so Caligula in this thing, man. So you just, he has all the boss monsters, maybe a demon prince. You get all these badass fights in there. You do all these crazy puzzles. You fight the Minotaur. You go through the labyrinth. You do all the classic Greek stuff. You get to the end. And he's like, yes, of course, come to me, fight. Like it's, it's, it's really <laughs> silly. But I just, I can't stop thinking about him in that classic Greek with the little weird leaf halo around his head. It's exactly mm -hmm. where he belongs. I don't know, hail Caesar. All right, that's, that's, that's going to be the end of this. I hope you all enjoyed. Please like, share, subscribe, jump to our Patreon. 
and make sure when you go into a tomb to first read who made it. If it's made in China, you're good. If it's made by Syrac, go away. <laughs> a cleric, is there any final thoughts you have on our boy before we tune out? The guy needs a hobby, a better hobby than making traps. You got infinite time. I think that is his hobby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, maybe, that is, maybe, that is, maybe he's found his hobby and he's perfectly happy. But geez, if you have infinite time, I would at least I would at least want to watch the traps going off. But I don't think he even does that. I think he just makes it and walks away. And that's I, I don't know. I don't know. I think to a Sidorak, making traps is like painting minis. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like he just tears through. Them. I can see it. Yeah. All right, everybody, please like, share, subscribe. We're doing Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Please tune in for that and tune in for everything next week. Goodbye. We appreciate you. Oh, I'm supposed to marry at the end. You've just been listening to Dumpstat, a podcast presented by Horizon Kingdoms. Horizon Kingdoms is a Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition server that's free to play. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and join up on Discord to join in on a new adventure. For more Dumpstat, be sure to find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe.